APSA's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee welcomes you to our first DEI education session. Today, we'll be discussing how to recognize and respond to implicit bias. During this session, we will present a guest lecture by Dr. Quinn Capers on bias in healthcare. Dr. Capers is an interventional cardiologist from UT Southwestern and an expert in bias. This presentation will be followed by case discussions on how to mediate bias across professional domains. At the end of this session, you should be able to define implicit bias, give real life examples of bias in healthcare, and have strategies to mitigate implicit bias when it is occurring. Uh, we're gonna start here, and you know all about this. You know about implicit bias, this, this, uh, this concept that really intrigues me um, that, uh, that our unconscious brain can make associations based on what we see often. And when we see things often enough, our unconscious brain really trying to help us out will, uh, will say that this is the truth about the universe. It will make that association, it will couple. Uh, uh, and uh, here's an example that I like to show. Uh, if every time I've seen a nun, a woman dressed as a Catholic nun, she's shown to me as doing something kind uh, and warm hearted and compassionate. Uh, if I see that enough times, my unconscious brain makes that connection. Nun equals compassion, equals warm hearted. On the other hand, um, what if every time or very often I'm shown a young black man in a hoodie and uh, he's shown to me as uh, being taken away in handcuffs or committing some violent act or playing the bad guy in the movie uh, or in the hip hop video. Uh, if I see that enough times, my unconscious brain will make that association. That young black man in a hoodie equals danger. Uh, now I'd like you to imagine that these two people come to me as patients. They're complaining of shortness of breath. Now I'm a cardiologist, that's a complaint that I hear a lot. The nun comes complaining of shortness of breath because of my unconscious association, I might treat these two people differently. For the nun, uh, I might say, I might be very motivated because of my unconscious association to do everything I can to help her. So I mean, I'm ordering, I'm not stopping at the checks raise, I'm ordering uh, uh, PET scans, CAT scans, MRIs, pulmonary function tests. I've got to find out what the problem is. On the other hand, the young black man in a hoodie comes to me complaining of shortness of breath. And it's possible that because of my unconscious association uh, that my approach to him is completely different. I take a, a cursory listen to his lungs and I say, you know what? I don't uh, hear uh, anything that sounds unusual. I don't think you really need a chest x-ray today. Come back in two weeks if you're not better. Totally different. And what is insidious about implicit bias is that I leave those interactions feeling like I've treated everybody fairly. Uh, now imagine, um, uh, and this is particularly pertinent uh, this week. Now imagine that I am a law enforcement officer and I'm called to the scene of a crime uh, because I'm told there's a disturbance. When I arrive, I see a nun. Well, the first thing I do probably is smile. And, and I say, good morning, sister. How can I help you today? What seems to be the problem? On the other hand, if I arrive and there's a young black man in a hoodie, uh, because of my unconscious association, I just might approach him with my hand on my firearm. And I'm talking to him all right, but it's not in soft, quiet, polite manner. I'm yelling and barking orders at him. Um, um, yet that night at the dinner table, when my family asked me how did my day go, I say I had a wonderful day treating everybody fairly. Because in my mind, I really have. That is the power of this implicit bias. We all have them. It's simply how the brain responds. Uh, and you're likely aware that there is a computer-based test to uncover what are some of your unconscious associations. The most common one is the implicit association test. It's not the only one, but it's the one that's been used most commonly. It turns out the results on those implicit association tests have been associated with discriminatory behaviors in the education system, in the criminal justice system, and in the healthcare system. So let me just share with you some uh, images in the world around us, because uh, I want to I make it clear how this works. Um, we take in these images all around us, uh, and our unconscious brain, looking for patterns in the world to help us navigate the world, uh, will uh, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly start making associations. What you're looking at here uh, is a photograph taken of a billboard in Savannah, Georgia. A physician was driving. She saw the, this billboard, got out and took a picture of it and put it on her Twitter page. Um, and it stimulated some discussion just like she wanted. If you can't read it, 
uh, because it's not the clearest. Uh, on the billboard are three white males in surgical caps and masks. The only print on the billboard says all cardiothoracic surgeons look like this. That's it. I know, I know the first thing you're thinking is, <laughs> What, what, are, what are they selling? What is the purpose of this billboard? And, and that's not true, by the way. But rather than think about what's going on in the minds of the advertising agency that put this up, uh, I'd rather have you think about the impact that this has on the little girl that lives across the street, who sees it every day on her way to school. If she sees this or images like this enough, her unconscious brain will make that association that cardiothoracic surgeons are men. That's how this works. What I wanna do now is show you a, uh, uh, I'm gonna show you a video. Uh, and this is a real video from uh, a local news station in Chicago. Uh, Cause I'm trying to make the point to you that, that what we see uh, uh, seeps into our unconscious. And if we see it enough, our unconscious will make that association. Well, we all uh, are familiar with the fact that Chicago has tremendous uh, problems with uh, homicide and gun violence. And uh, here, uh, there was another shooting on the black side of town. Um, and uh, as happens often, not always, but often, it was a black person shooting another black person. So the reporters are going to interview the bystanders. One of the bystanders that they interview, get this, is a four-year-old little boy. So I want you to pay attention to what this four-year-old little boy says, and then pay attention to what you hear the anchor say at the end of the session. So uh, let me pick this up, turn up your volume if you need to. Again, this is real. This is a real news clip after a shooting in Chicago. As an 18-year-old man and 16-year-old girl were hit while standing on the sidewalk. Males in good condition while the girl's expected to recover. And kids on the street, as young as four, were there to see it all unfold. And a disturbing reaction. Yeah, well, I'm not scared of nothing. When you get older, you get scared of all these guns? No. No? No. What do you want to do when you get older? I'm going to have me a gun. Because I live right here, and I don't want none of my family members to get me shot. That is very scary indeed. So far, no suspects have been custody. Okay, so two things. So one, uh, what did the four-year-old little boy say? Um, you heard him. He said, I'm going to get me a gun. He didn't say it's shy and bashful either. He said it with a little, what we call swagger. I'm going to get me a gun. And then at the end, you hear the uh, anchor say, that is very scary indeed. So just in case you didn't know how you're supposed to feel about what you just saw, he's helping you out and telling you you're supposed to be afraid. Take that into, into heart. I want you to say you just saw a shooting and a four-year-old little boy who witnessed a shooting says, I'm going to get me a gun too. Let me show you that same interview, that same little boy with a little bit of a different perspective. Again, turn your volume up on your device if you need to. I like the hair. You ain't scared of nothing. Damn. When you get older, you guys stay away from all these guns? No. No? No. What do you want to do when you get older? I'm going to have me a gun. You are? Why do you want to do that? Cool. You know I'm going to be the police. Okay. Well, then, then we can have Okay, so what he was saying was, I'm going to have a gun because I'm going to be the police and I'm going to protect my neighborhood from this kind of crime. But somebody at that news station saw fit to take that raw footage and cut it right after he says, I'm going to get me a gun and show that to the millions in the Chicagoland area. And I, I know what you're thinking. You want to talk about the motivation of that person or of that person's supervisor because somebody had to sign off on that. We could spend all my time talking about that. I'd rather have you think about the impact that that has on the unconscious mind of everybody watching. And that if you see this kind of thing often enough, your unconscious brain in an attempt to help you out will make that connection. Um, and so uh, just imagine that over the years you're exposed to images similar to the ones I just saw and our world is full of them. What unconscious associations would your brain make? Well, your brain will tell you that women are not cardiothoracic surgeons, they, 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 that's, that just doesn't make sense. Uh, and that black men are dangerous. Uh, and what's important to point out, and I'll do it again and again, is that these can be quite different from how you feel consciously. Consciously, you might have the most egalitarian outlook and philosophy 
all people are created equal, all people have equal value. That might be your conscious brain. But your unconscious brain might hold these truths uh, to be self-evident. And as I've shown you, this can impact how we treat people. Well, physicians are not immune. Uh, Janice Saban and her colleagues in 2009 tapped into that implicit association test database where millions of people have taken this test. And they looked at the results for those who said their occupation was physician versus everyone else. And what they found was that implicit white race preference, that means an unconscious automatic association of a white face with good things and the unconscious automatic association of a black face with bad things like pain, fear, danger, violence, misery, et cetera, um, was, uh, was common, uh, most common amongst white physicians, um, but it was also common amongst Asian and Hispanic physicians. Guess what? There was only one group of physicians that were overall neutral, and those were black physicians. Some of the black physicians had implicit black race preference. Some had implicit white race preference, but the majority and overall as a group, they were neutral. So physicians have these implicit biases. Now, how do we treat people? Uh, we know this from social psychology research, how you and I treat somebody if they're from a group that we are unconsciously negatively biased against in a one-on-one -on -one interaction. We allow them less time to speak. So we tend to interrupt them and talk over them. We smile less. We make fewer impromptu social comments. How about, how about that game last night? How about the weather? Uh, and we make less eye contact. So just think about that. Think about that in patient interactions. Think about that in an interview setting. Um, um, and here's an example of how that might be playing out. So this is a real live study with real live patients and doctors. These are cancer doctors. 18 oncologists took the black-white implicit association test in this study in 2016. Uh, they then forgot about the results and went about their business treating patients over several weeks. They saw over 100 black patients. The patients and the physicians in the study consented to having the office visit videotape and then graded by neutral observers. And there were three important findings. One, if the doctor had implicit white race preference, the duration of their office visit with the black patients was shorter than with their white patients. The second thing they found is that the communication style with the black patients, if the doctor had implicit white race preference, was what we call verbal dominance, which means I'm doing all the talking. This is what we have, this is what you have, this is what we're gonna do, see you next week. As opposed to asking the patient, how do you feel about this? And what questions do you have? And then the third uh, finding was that uh, if the doctor had implicit white race preference, when they had the patients fill out patient satisfaction surveys, the black patients were less satisfied with the office visit if that doctor had implicit white race preference. And this is really fascinating because it's not like those patients knew, I didn't enjoy this visit with Dr. Jones because he had implicit white race preference, but they don't know that. But there's something in the communication style that led them to feel like, I'm not so sure this doctor has my best interest at heart. We don't even know it. So let me ask you, if you've ever had an interaction with a patient, or since you all are pediatric surgeons, with a patient's family, and if you felt like yourself, uh, if you asked yourself coming out of that, I don't know, I don't know why, but for some reason, we just didn't connect. I went in with my same compassion heart that I always do, but I don't know, something just didn't feel right, just didn't connect. It could be that you were interacting with somebody that you were unconsciously, negatively biased against. Um, and it could be that they could feel it too. So this is what can happen. Uh, here's another example of what can happen uh, with a little more perhaps dire consequences. This is a study with resident physicians. And these resident physicians uh, uh, took the implicit association test, and then they were shown uh, case vignettes. And the vignettes were of uh, uh, a man having a heart attack. Half of them were shown the photograph of a black man having a heart attack, the other half shown the photograph of a white man. But the clinical vignette was identical. It was identical. Mr. T is 50 years old. He's got severe chest pain. His EKG shows this. It was clear ST elevation myocardial infarction. And they were asked, would you treat this patient with thrombolytic therapy, which is the drug that opens up the blocked coronary artery and stops the heart attack and saves a life? Um, uh, what they found was that the residents were less likely to treat the black man than the white man, even though the clinical vignette was identical. And when the residents, uh, when the researchers, I'm sorry, 
tried to see what was it that was the strongest predictor of whether or not they would treat either the black or the white man, it was the implicit negative bias about black people. That was the strongest predictor of those residents saying, no, uh, I don't think this black man needs thrombolytic therapy. Yes, I think this white man needs thrombolytic therapy. So here's an example of what could be happening out there. Our unconscious mind could make certain positive or negative associations that then affects our clinical decision making, sometimes uh, when those decisions are life or death decisions. So uh, now that's alarming enough, right? Implicit bias, and we're doctors. We take an oath. We are, we're in this because we're humanitarians. So the thought that our unconscious brain could lead us to treat people differently based on how they look, race, skin tone, gender, uh, obesity, whether or not they're elder, I mean, that, that is, uh, uh, that's disturbing. But guess what? It's not all implicit. Um, uh, that uh, implicit association test also asks you about your known conscious explicit biases. So if you go back and read every paper you've read about physician implicit bias, they also report to you the explicit bias. It's usually not the biggest point in the paper. Uh, but uh, white, Asian, and Hispanic physicians have all, as a group, self-reported mild levels of explicit anti-Black bias. Uh, and even our trainees, even medical students, uh, have self-reported negative attitudes, conscious negative attitudes about Black. So I know we're talking about implicit bias. But I just wanted to make the case that the bias is not always implicit. Uh, how about uh, words on a page? Uh, this is uh, uh, very important uh, as we are in application interview season uh, because uh, sometimes uh, we might tend to think that words on a page don't stimulate biases as much as photographs do, uh, but actually they can. Uh, I love this study. It was well done. In this study, lawyers and law school professors around the country were sent what they were told was uh, an exercise in legal writing uh, from the researchers. And the researchers said, we need your help. Please help us grade this paper. Uh, we want you to count up the errors that you see, uh, legal errors, errors of legal analysis, not uh, typos, uh, and write whatever you want to on this paper about this student and send it back to us. Half of those law school professors were sent uh, uh, a, lab a paper labeled just this way, Thomas Meyer, African-American male. They didn't say anything about race, but it simply happened to be on the paper. The other half were sent Thomas Meyer, Caucasian male. The researchers intentionally inserted 22 errors of legal analysis in the essay. The essays were identical, except for this labeling of either African-American or Caucasian for the student. Here's what they found. On the comments that came back, Caucasian Thomas Meyer, uh, they were generally a good writer, needs to work on a few things, has potential and good analytical skills. African-American Thomas Meyer, it was needs lots of work. I can't believe he went to NYU, average at best. Uh, of those 22 errors, on average 10 were found in Caucasian Thomas Meyer's paper, and on average 15 were found in African-American Thomas Meyer's paper. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the same paper. It's the same essay. So this uh, 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 hints at what could be happening is that if in our mind, white is worthy and intelligent and black is less worthy and less intelligent, we might read the applications differently. We might read the applications more critically. Um, medical school admissions, we do a lot of reading applications, don't we? Uh, so we decided to study that. And what we found that more than half of our admissions committee at The Ohio State University have what we call an unconscious bias that man equals career and woman equals homemaker. There's actually an IAT that's set up that way. So what's important about that is that here, this young lady could be interviewing for medical school, residency, or fellowship, and her interviewer is wanting to be fair consciously, but if uh, when he looks at her, his unconscious mind sees homemaker, the question is, is she at a disadvantage? What if she's interviewing to be CEO of a company? Is she at a disadvantage? We worry about that. Uh, this, what, these are the raw results of our uh, admission committee results on the black white race IAT, where we found that 52% of the women on our admissions committee, we got a big admissions committee, 140 people, and 64% of the men have implicit white race preference, which again, my unconscious mind says that white is good 
and black is bad, 52% and 64%. Um, here's a question that you're asked on that IAT. You're asked, what best describes you? And you have to pick one. I prefer whites to blacks, or I'm neutral. I like white and blacks equally, or I prefer blacks to whites. You must pick one. And so um, um, I just wanted to go back here and show you what are these small bars here, 10%. Those are the uh, uh, people who, who picked, um, I prefer whites to blacks. So that's right, 10% of the women and 10% of the men uh, admitted to consciously preferring uh, white people uh, over black people. This is the admissions committee. This is the committee that decides who gets to be a doctor and who doesn't. Do you know what the results would look like with your admissions committee or your residency selection committee? or your fellowship selection committee, I'd recommend you do this exercise uh, if you have it. Because here's what we're concerned could be happening. This young man is applying for medical school. Um, he's done all the right things. Uh, this could be Dr. Barksdale's son interviewing for residency or fellowship. And the faculty member is a fair person. But if when he looks at this young man, uh, his unconscious mind associates him with this violent image, unbeknownst to him, by the way, this is in his unconscious mind, then I wonder if he is gonna grade his essay the same way. I wonder if he's gonna rate his interview answers the same way. So we wrote this up uh, in 2017 and, uh, uh, and, and it's, uh, it's really, I think, uh, changed how we think about uh, admissions. Um, so I'm gonna end with something that we do at our, uh, at our implicit bias workshops. There are tools, we all have implicit bias, but there are tools to help us reduce or neutralize mitigate our implicit biases in a one-on-one -on -one interaction. And that's what we're gonna go through, uh, Dr. Newman and I, uh, in the workshop. So the first one is called common identity formation. This one is simply finding out where your, uh, and I like to think of Venn diagrams, where your Venn diagram and this person's Venn diagram intersect. What common group identities do you share? Maybe you're music lovers, maybe you're sports lovers, maybe you're from the same hometown. It turns out, as soon as you find out that you have this common group identity, that actually inhibits the neural pathways that activate the unconscious negative bias. So probe until you find out that you both like the same hockey team or you both like uh, Aretha Franklin or you both like to watch Seinfeld reruns because as soon as you find that out, now you're in the same group and your implicit bias goes down. Perspective taking. Force yourself to see the world through this person's eyes. When you do that, you develop empathy and that's the key. Empathy actively opposes unconscious bias. The more empathy you develop, whether it's a patient or somebody you're interviewing, uh, the more, uh, the, the less uh, unconscious negative bias you'll have. Consider the opposite. When you've gone through the data and you're about to make a decision, call a timeout, force yourself to re-review the data. This time though, your assignment is to pick out things that convince you of the opposite conclusion. Now make a decision. That process has been shown to reduce uh, our implicit negative bias. And then finally, uh, counter stereotypical exemplars, uh, force yourself to spend time around people who are not like you and uh, focus on people uh, who are not like you, uh, people that you might have an implicit bias against. Um, read their autobiography, uh, look at their interviews on YouTube. Uh, when you do that, you will see traits that you admire and slowly your unconscious negative bias against that person will come down. Those very same strategies we actually have on a card, we call it our implicit bias reduction cheat sheet. And on interview day, uh, and this was at Ohio State, and we're gonna start this uh, here at UT Southwestern, uh, our interviewer, in addition to having the credentials of the person he's about to interview, he's got this cheat sheet that reminds him of these strategies. So when he starts the interview, he already has gone over these strategies to reduce implicit bias. Uh, and it's one of our latest papers that gives a stepwise um, um, account of how to reduce implicit bias uh, in, uh, in academic medicine. So our first case scenario is one of hiring a pediatric surgeon at your institution. Specifically, you're looking for a surgeon who will be able to build out your CDH program and help expand your program. Naima is a fresh graduate from Pediatric Surgery Fellowship and is applying for this position. As noted in her academic, academic experience, she has research interest in CDH and a track record of publications in this area. Sabina, when you review the applicant's um, qualifications, uh, what things stick out to you and what things might you have to pay attention to in terms of biases we may hold? Well, you know, the first, of course, is 
taking a look just at, you know, the straightforward qualifications for what you're looking for. Naima obviously has um, some really great training coming out of the University of Louisville um, and specifically the niche that you're trying to fill or the category you're trying to fill within your um, faculty is someone who has an interest and has, um, has a strong history with CDH. And so she, she obviously fills those kind of two um, areas. Um, and as we, you know, interact with Naima and try to build rapport, I think one of the first things we can do is, is find that common interest, um, that shared common identity. So for, for me personally, it would be within um, her research interests. Um, we all are pretty familiar with CDH and um, prepping for her interview, I would at least have read one of her papers. Excellent. Um, in terms of the fact that it's listed on her application that um, although she has significant teaching involvement, she really doesn't have any extracurricular activities um, listed or no committee involvement. Um, what would your bias be towards someone that has no extracurricular or committee involvement um, on their application? Yeah, you know, that's a really great question. I think there's a lot of bias that that um, represents a person not being quote unquote well-rounded um, or uh, other such kind of uh, catchphrases. What's the, uh, what I think is important about extracurricular activities is how they, um, is, is why are they so important to us? And, and it's always been my um, assessment that, you know, achieving expertise in some other hobby or field um, is an indication of one's discipline and one's dedication and one's commitment to excelling at whatever they do. And, um, for many reasons, whether um, you're working a full-time job at the same time that you're studying, whether you grew up with a socioeconomic status that, it, that didn't afford you to be able to go skiing on weekends, um, or even just your cultural heritage and background where maybe studying is more and family is more important than spending time outside of, um, outside of the home. There's, there's many other um, reasons that you may not have a, 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 you know, prototypical hobby like skiing or violin or something like that. Um, and if we truly are trying to determine, um, is Naima a person who has, you know, the resilience and the grit and the determination to, to, uh, to be successful? I mean, there's many other things about Naima just on surface that make you think, you know, she, she's made it pretty far. Yeah, I think one other thing that we have to consider when dealing with minority applicants or minoritized people is a lack of mentorship and sponsorship as well. Um, so I do think it's harder for those groups to navigate kind of the committee world and the extracurricular world um, and really find good opportunities, which may be easily afforded to, to other groups. Absolutely, I think that's a really good point. And, you know, it's, I think it's a good question about, you know, people who are underrepresented, they may be hard to relate to. Counter stereotype exemplars are sometimes even difficult to come up with as I, as I think about for Naima. Um, do any come to mind for you? Um, well, there is Ihan Omar in Congress. Um, that's a good example. Is a great example of um, someone that's really come far um, and is very successful. Um, in what she does. One of my personal favorite, favorites actually is Halima Aiden, right? And she's, you may or may not be familiar with her, but she's actually a Somali American model, um, which yeah. I delight in because here you have a woman who, who chooses to express her modesty and yet made the cover of Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition. So, you know, she's really kind of breaking some of those stereotypes and everything that she does and achieves. Yeah, I think that's a good example even of um, kind of reversing your decision or reversing your perspective on situations. Like, as you said, she's a very modest person, and yet here she is on the Sports Illustrated swimsuit cover, which seems very like two very incongruent things. 
Um, and I think sometimes when we're reviewing candidates, kind of taking a step back from maybe your initial reaction of you know, this person isn't right for us and saying, well, in what ways is this person right for us? Um, what are the things that would make them fit here really well in their application and would make them a really strong candidate and make sure that you're not, that you're seeing those things and you don't have blinders on. Um, can you think of any examples in this situation where we would maybe kind of reverse our dis decision um, or biases that we may have from that perspective? Well, I think the letter points out something that's very, you know, interesting. It makes a specific a reference to to not shaking hands and um, as a Muslim hijabi uh, raised in the south you know I actually think that uh, southern um, etiquette for a, a male is not to actually put out your hand unless the female makes the first move and even in our current environment of being particular about touch it behooves us all to get the proper cues before doing so um, and so as you kind of look at, oh, it might be rude for her not to put out her hand. Well, maybe it's the opposite's true. Maybe you putting out your hand without the proper cues is potentially the, the more rude of behaviors. Yeah, I think that's important to think about in terms of you know, our own interactions with people and, and maybe things that we think are appropriate that other people would feel uncomfortable with. Yeah, I think you and I chatted once about uh, hanging out in France and not wanting to be kissed. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. The assumption that everybody wants to be kissed on the cheek, which is very common in French culture, um, is not necessarily something that everyone's comfortable with. And um, I, I think the letter of recommendation brings up a couple interesting points in terms of how to write a letter of recommendation. And oh, absolutely. Screeners we need to have on when we're reviewing other people's um, letters of recommendations about appropriateness of things that might be included, uh, like the reference to her faith. Um, as well, which you know, can create a barrier of her as other or alien, which is not necessarily something you want to do ever when you're writing a reference letter in support of somebody. Sure. Um, and it should be something you really disregard reading a, a letter as well. Yeah, there's, I think, really great examples here of, of words that are used that are pretty um, gender um, specifically biased, as well as what's probably an irrelevant reference to her faith. Yeah, I agree. I think the studies really show that, unfortunately, for females that get letters of recommendation, it tends to focus more on their kind of softer qualities, their compassion, um, their smiles, their attitudes, whereas when males get reference letters written for them, they focus on their professional achievements. And then when you end up comparing them side by side, it often comes out that the male candidate is a stronger candidate because of the way the letter was written irrespective of who actually is the stronger candidate. Right, you would, you would imagine that this program director would be s just super proud of how published and how accomplished Naima is um, within this realm and, and highlight what a perfect fit she would be for that, that need in the program. Yeah, so I definitely think there's work to be done in terms of us all getting better at writing our reference letters and editing to ensure that they're equitable and not biased. Agreed. You, Sarah, a Hispanic female, and John Smith, a white male, are co-chiefs on the surgery service. Third-year medical students surrounding on the patients as part of your team. For the most part, you and John have a great working relationship. You notice two students who seem to consistently struggle on the team, Harry, a white male, and Monique, a black female. Both students seem engaged, but neither student has a correct answer when called on at rounds. At the mid-rotation evaluation, you notice that John scores Harry better than Monique on clinical knowledge. You expect similar scores due to their performance, but the drastic differences in their scoring has caught you off guard. John Smith handles grading, and you see that he tends to score Harry's presentations higher than Monique's. Having learned about implicit bias, you understand that John isn't necessarily intentionally trying to be unfair to either Harry or Monique. Nevertheless, you know that something must be done to address this grading, subsequent academic achievement, opportunity slash discrepancy. In what ways might implicit bias be operating in this scenario? There's a couple different ways in which we're noticing an implicit bias in this situation. Um, one is gender and the other is racial. 
there's numerous studies that have confirmed that these implicit assumptions interfere with objective assessment of an applicant's qualification in both an employment setting as well as in schools. There are several studies that have also documented differences in letters of recommendations for both male and female applicants. Microaggressions such as these um, directed at students or others in the environment they precipitate the stress response results in impaired critical thinking, lower speech fluency, sleep disorders, as well as long-term memory loss. The performance of a student preoccupied by these issues may truly underrepresent his or her, her abilities. Underrepresented in medicine have an additional shoulder burden as they strive to learn and demonstrate their abilities in a clinical environment. How would you open a conversation about this discrepancy with your co-chief? A simple statement saying, hey, John, I'm curious about your evaluation process of the medical students. Do you have a system in place and what factors do you focus on the most? I would love to pick your brain on these strategies. What are some ways that you might address possible implicit bias and grading on an institutional level? What are some strategies the institution could design and implement that could help reduce the likelihood that some students are being graded differently than others? Using a standardized object, adjective check, checklist along with um, percentage of forms um, on which a given adjective is checked for the class as a whole is a great uh, way to start. Um, However, removing adjectives from the checklist that are found to be susceptible to gender bias has also been really helpful. In addition, providing readers with information about gender bias in the adjective database could be part of a comprehensive effort to raise awareness of unconscious sources of bias affecting student evaluation. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this APSA training session. I'm Dr. Hana Lamayu, and I'm a pediatric surgeon at the University of South Alabama in Mobile, Alabama. I'm here today with Dr. Numa Perez, who is a general surgery resident at the Massachusetts General Hospital and a fellow in healthcare innovations at the Healthcare Transformation Lab. Thank you, Dr. Alamayu. Uh, it's a great pleasure and an honor to discuss this important topic with you. So today we're going to be reviewing the role of implicit biases in our patient provider relationships. And we're going to start by looking at a quick case. So you have a five-year-old boy with a deep second degree burn to his hand, which is secondary to a grease burn. He's following up in your clinic after a hospital discharge. You had discharged him with clear wound care instructions, which included daily dressing changes with bacitracin. As you walk into the exam room, you notice his mom, who's a black woman in her mid-30s, on the phone speaking what sounds like Haitian Creole. The child's dressing is dirty and barely hanging on. So you stand there for about 10 seconds, but his mom doesn't seem to notice you. And so you turn around and walk out of the exam room. So let's take a pause there. Dr. Perez, what do you think is going on here? Yeah, you know, we, we don't know all the facts yet, but on, on the surface, um, it seems like perhaps the child's uh, wound care has not been uh, performed the way you, you had instructed uh, his family to. Yeah, so, so what do you think about that? Why do you think that's going on? and and what do you think we should do about it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's again, operating on, on what we know so far, right? We, we have a young mom who seems to sort of be on the phone, uh, not paying attention to her child, that doesn't even notice that you're in the room. Um, and, and you have a child who's dressing, appears to be soiled, it appears to be, you know, falling off the child's hand. And so, you know, it's hard not to come to the conclusion that, that you know, some neglect may be going on. And so as a provider, I think you might want to, you know, want to act on that. Okay. Well, let's see what happened in the case. So, you know, you walk outside of the room and ask your medical assistant to uh, please call a social worker, um, as you might have a, a potential child neglect situation. Uh, the medical assistant uh, pauses and explains to you that, that no such thing is going on, uh, that she knows this mom and she's actually a junior medicine attendant that was recently hired to your hospital. Um, and she says the child's dressing was actually uh, perfectly clean and intact until uh, he started playing in the waiting room and put his hand right into a planter and began uh, picking at it. Um, she also tells you that mom is, is indeed Creole speaking uh, and she received a phone call from one of her patients who's also from uh, Haitian descent uh, with some serious matters that she was tending to 
And that's why she didn't notice you when you came in. Um, at that point, you sort of stand in front of your medical assistant, uh, quite embarrassed, and, and you ask yourself whether you would have acted that way if mom was not a, a, a black young woman or if she was you know, of a different race or a different color. So this scenario kind of shows us how quickly we can end up at a very different conclusion than, than where we might otherwise be, um, particularly when we consider the role of, of biases and, and presumptions that we make. What do you think? Yeah, I have to agree, Dr. Laimai. I mean, it, it, <clears throat> part of what we wanted to drive with this scenario is the fact that implicit biases uh, tend to manifest uh, especially when we're operating uh, using system one uh, thinking, you know, which is, is, is the system where we operate primarily on uh, preconceived notions, assumptions, and, and heuristics. And importantly, those of us in medicine and surgery uh, tend to operate uh, using system one thinking uh, frequently, you know, and we do it for good reason. We develop patterns uh, to recognize uh, clinical situations um, that, that we sort of enact without necessarily thinking about it. Uh, and, but we must be aware that it is done during those situations uh, where we are much more likely to allow our implicit biases which live in, in our unconscious mind to manifest. Yeah, so I think you're exactly right. You know, whatever um, preconceived ideas that we have about young mothers or, or, you know, young mothers of color or children with dirty dressings, um, you know, parents on the phone not listening to us, all of those sort of come into play in the first 10 seconds of, of this scenario. So this is the perfect example of, of where we take a moment and we can use some of those strategies that Dr. Capers discussed in his presentation to mitigate you know, some of those preconceptions that we may have. Um, so for example, using common identity formation, if we just took a moment um, to look at this mom and try to find a, something that we can relate to where we might have a common identity. So in my case, it would be that I'm also a mom and I might have, you know, experience with very rambunctious young children and just take a moment and, and see where that common identity might help us sort of understand each other better. Um, and kind of going in uh, hand in hand with that is perspective taking. So taking the moment to, to try to understand the other person's perspective and see the situation from their eyes. And so, you know, again, in this particular scenario, she ends up being a, a busy medicine attending, which makes it very easy to understand her perspective after that. But without that extra information, you just have to take the time to ask the questions to kind of give you that perspective since you can't just come up with it on your own. Right, exactly. And then, you know, right along those lines and, and very much related to perspective taking is, is the act of, of taking the counter factual approach, right? So stopping, pausing, uh, and very quickly sort of uh, uh, defining your view at that point your view of the world, your explanation of what be going on, and then purposefully taking the counterfactual approach uh, and then incorporating what you just explained about perspective taking um, and try to develop an alternate explanation, uh, an alternate narrative for what is going on, okay? Yeah, that's exactly right. So you could consider the opposite of, the opposite of whatever assumption you've made. And then um, importantly, and the last point here is also to counter those stereotypical exemplars that might, you might be relying on to come to your conclusions. And I think that's that's the key to all of this. So when, when we are faced with these situations where we fall into that um, system one thinking, we really have to take the time to stop and think about it and make use of these four tools. I think this scenario is also an excellent example of um, making sure you consider both your, your negative implicit biases, but also your positive implicit biases. So if this patient looked different and his mom looked different and sort of presented as what we would consider a well-to-do professional person, then maybe we would be less likely to consider something like neglect, but that positive implicit bias might actually lead us to miss a real case of neglect. So I think it's important to consider that we can use these tools both for our 
positive and negative implicit biases when we take care of our patients and therefore do a better job of taking care of them. Absolutely. We all have implicit biases. They come from the way we were raised, the way we grew up, where we grew up. We just need to acknowledge them and then be purposeful uh, about consciously implementing strategies like the ones you just explained uh, to combat them. This brings to a conclusion our session on recognizing and responding to implicit bias. I hope that after participating in this session, you can define implicit bias, give examples of bias in healthcare, and are armed with strategies to mitigate bias when it is occurring, such as finding common ground, being willing to take the perspective of someone new, considering alternative decisions, and looking for counter-stereotypic exemplars. I would like to thank Dr. Capers for his lecture and the presenters from the APSA DEI Committee for your help with this project.